not in. <laughs> <laughs> Miracles. <laughs> they do happen once in a while. <laughs> that's the second time in the last four weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's two in a row. That's a pretty good streak. <laughs> no, we haven't got two in a row. <laughs> All right, a couple of people getting in here yet. I'm getting some audio connected, so we'll hang out for a smidge. Can I just say happy Mother's Day to my daughter? Next week, but not this week. It's too early. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <So it's> <laughs> we can celebrate Mother's Day anytime, Mom. You're good. Thank you. <laughs> Arma's not here yet. No. I think he might be along with Morgan's because the sign is Morgan vote. I was going to say that's a family member I haven't met yet. All right. I think we'll go ahead and get started. A um, couple of folks are still connecting to audio, but I think we'll, it's um, 10.15, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, anybody have anything you'd like to mention or bring up other than Happy Mother's Day a week early um, before we get started? <laughs> okay, then we'll go back to our study in Jude. And we are, um, let me share my screen. Oh, I gotta hang on. Um, we have, um, okay. one second here. Open up another one. Doubt and Hans are coming in. And Jason is coming in. So we are good on that, okay. I will then share my screen so we can go to the handout. Did you print up the handout? Good morning, Jason. Welcome aboard. Good morning, Wayne. How's it going? Good morning, Jason. All right. So we are, um, last week we had started our study in verses five through seven and <clears throat> we had come through this first, to this first example um, in verse five. Just to recap that um, in verse four, Jude had identified the two false teachings, and now he's going to give three Old Testament examples of God bringing judgment ultimately upon error, uh, false, not specifically false teachers always, but rebellion against God. So the first one, as we started looking at last week, was Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward, or literally the second time, destroyed those who did not believe. So the first deliverance coming out of Egypt with the 10 plagues, and then the destruction was um, after they rebelled and would not go in to the promised land. We want to take a look at this larger section from Numbers for that second half of this verse. I'm going to switch over to um, the text here. So in... Um, in uh, Numbers 13, 25, we're not going to read through every single verse here, but enough of the highlights to remind ourselves and to look at a few key points along the way, key in the sense of this context in Jude. So at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. Recall the 12 spies have been sent by um, Moses into the promised land to scope it out. They came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. And if we stop right there after verse 27, so far so good. And what they effectively were saying in verse 27 is we found it just like God said. So that's the, the word of God being established by what they found. Well, it was established anyway, but being um, illustrated by what they found in, in the promised land. Mm -hmm. But then at the beginning of verse 28 is the, the rough word, however. We mm -hmm. found it just like God promised, but. 
The people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. So everything is there as we saw it, as just as God said. It's great. It's bountiful. God's word is true. But here's the problem. God didn't tell us that we can't do it because there's too many enemies. There's too much going on. We can't, we can't possibly go in there and conquer. Another but. So, however, the people are there. They're against us. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. There, um, Caleb is now returning back to that sure word of God. God had promised, here's what the land is like. I'm going to give you that land. Everybody confirmed the land is like that. We can't do it. Caleb goes back to that promise. I'm going to give it to you. Verse 31, counterpoint. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. So there, it's a pretty interesting. You look at a number of different places throughout scripture where there's just a clear and absolute contradiction to what God says. Garden of Eden, it starts there. God said, dying, you will die. The day you eat of it, dying, you will die. The devil says, you will not surely die. Um, God said, we'll be able to, I will give you this land. Caleb echoes it. The people, the other 10 spies say, we are not able to go up against the people. It is absolutely a bold faced contradiction to what God has said. I put that back into the context of Jude in verse four, denying Christ and perverting the, God, the grace of God. It's the same thing, just a different look, um, but it's really the same, the same sin at, at root. Verse 32, so they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from Nephilim, and we seemed, like ourself, we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. So this is also interesting in how this is presented. Now, this is in the context of Jude, of those who are slipping into the congregation and doing this twisting. So, um, so the, uh, the first report to, was the land flows with milk and honey. But when they brought that to the broader people, then no mention here in verses 32 and following, no mention of any of that blessing. The only thing they convey to the body at large is how impossible this is going to be and how foolish Caleb, and we know in a little bit that Joshua was also of the same ilk as Caleb. So you see that very sharp contrast between presenting God's word and his promises versus um, the human idea, we can't do this. Jason, you had your hand raised? I had my hand raised. You did. <laughs> no, I, well, well, I didn't, but I do want to say something. I wanted to say, um, a thing about I want for, so one sorry for being late and number two I was going to ask you a question okay ask away number one sorry for being late sorry for interrupting when I was that late and also my question would be is um, my question is is the it says what was my I forgot what my question was oh I I, I did, did you, are you there Wayne I am okay I'm sorry I didn't hear you then Moses and it, it says this what does it mean that they, um, so they fell on their faces. What does that mean? That mean like on the, not like on the, um, like on the prayer mat or something, they fell on their faces. That's the only thing I can see. Well, probably not really a prayer mat exactly, but yeah, falling in, in, on their faces. Um, like a big old mat there and everybody. Yeah, just praying. getting down and um, praying or mourning. You could fall on your face for a variety of things. Um, falling on your face to, to pray, to mourn to do a number of different things. There are cases in Jesus' ministry where people humbly came and fell at their face at Jesus' feet in um, recognition of his greatness mm -hmm. and their humble requesting of whatever it was that they needed. So um, going on then in chapter 14, um, all the congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader to go back to Egypt. We talked about this somewhat last week um, in terms of how 
how foolish this was for people who were yearning to leave the slavery of Egypt were saying, well, God brought us out to kill us. Um, what a terrible God he is. Let's go back to Egypt. And we have the benefit of the full view of, of um, hindsight here. They were on the brink of entering the promised land. Had they not rebelled here, they would have gone in. Now we know that they spent 40 years wandering, but they were ready to go in. And they were, in their foolishness and their rejection of God's promise, ready to choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Uh, it's just unbelievable. Um, and you see, again, that contrast. So Moses and Aaron, then in, in, their, in this trouble, fell on their faces um, before the, all the assembly. Verse 6, Joshua and Caleb are the two. They were two of the 12 spies. They tore their clothes in their dismay, despair, and said to the congregation of Israel, I'm here in the middle of verse seven, the land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. Now they get the good report. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And the reaction of the congregation was they were going to try to stone them. Um, Moses intercedes for the people, and then God promises judgment in verse 20. The Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, as Moses had interceded. But truly, as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice, shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. So the 10 times, um, the, if you go back through the leaving of Egypt to this point, I believe you come up a little short on, of 10, but you know, roughly 10 times, and there could easily be some that are not recorded in scripture. But we know, you know, you follow that history, we know how quick and easy they were to rebel and to complain. So God says, they put me to the test these 10 times, have not obeyed my voice, they shall not see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. And none of those who despised me shall see it with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, who were the only two of the 12 that were ready to go in. Um, in this next section, then uh, uh, God repeats and reemphasizes the same um, verse 31, but your little ones who you said would become a prey, I will bring in and they shall know the land that you have rejected. That foolishness of the people in rejecting God and turning away from his word said, well, God brought us out here and our kids are going to be killed and he just brought us out here to destroy us. God spins that around and says, as a result of this, you're not going in, but those children that you thought I brought out here or you said I brought out here to destroy, they're the ones that are going to inherit this land that's flowing with milk and honey. Verse 33, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days a year for each day, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this will I do to this wicked congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness, they shall come to a full end and there they shall die. And then the 10 spies who did not want to go forward and brought the bad report died by plague um, that God sent. So if you um, carry this into back to then Jude's reference to this, he references it in a pretty brief way, but for his readers, it would have brought back all this Old Testament history. And one of the huge takeaways is God's serious about this. There was no question about who stood with God, who stood against them, against him, and those who stood against God reaped their reward. Um, it's borne out very clearly in this Old Testament um, example that Jude uh, cites. Uh, before we look at the last couple points here um, with Jude 4, any uh, comments or questions that anybody would like to bring up? Okay. So then the, this brings us kind of bringing it to 
the people's complaint. First God delivered and then he destroyed his people. That's really what Jude says too. Um, saved the people out of the land of Egypt, second time destroyed them. What kind of God does that? Well, we know the rest of the story, but this is how the people of Israel viewed it. This is much the same kind of argument and objection against God that's raised today. Um, those that want to undermine the true God and draw false conclusions from a false non-contextual and superficial reading of scripture. Um, if God, if God really was a God of love, he wouldn't. And then you fill in the blank. That's the same kind of argument. What kind of God does that? Um, my God wouldn't do that. And then that way people change what scripture is saying or they misrepresent it, but it all comes from, it can be, a not drawing on the context of what was recorded in scripture. It can come from a wrong application of scripture, a wrong view of the things in the world. A lot of times just human reason without any scripture at all is really the, probably the biggest culprit of this. And this is also much the same objection. This is the last bullet in the bottom of page one um, that leads to being mystified that grace and justice can coexist in the same holy and righteous God. This becomes a pretty big stumbling block for people because in human reason, how could there be love and just the sternest, strongest judgment possible? And the, the rest of the story is, is that God's strong, thorough, and unequivocal judgment is on sin. And that judgment is right and just because of what sin is. That does not mean that in that same God, a gracious love can't exist. But for a lot of people, that's a huge struggle because they just, the, the human concept of, of love and a human concept of how horrible, every kind of hardship and judgment is horrible, those just don't mix. But in the true God, we have that sure justice, holy justice, and also deep um, grace kind of love. So that gets us to the last bullet here then. Um, the key to understanding this is to observe whom God destroyed and why. Those who did not believe is whom he destroyed. And then that places, this goes into the context of the two false doctrines, uh, perverting the grace of God, denying Christ. That's who's going to be destroyed. Those who um, proclaim that and those who follow them. Okay, unless there are any comments, we'll take a look at a couple other passages here. The, Pastor. Yes, go ahead. I have a quick question. Sorry, it's hard for me to unmic because I got to scroll over like five screens. Okay. Um, I do not want to track this to detract from the, the theological discussion that we're having right now. But um, the Nephilim came up in our Genesis Bible study, and I did not know what to say when I got questions about that. So like I said, if you want to do this after we go through the passages, I, I would love to get your thoughts on that, just what um, to share with the people in my other Bible study. But we don't have to do that right now. No, it's oh. affecting. Okay, I can, I can probably give you, the answer that I can give to you at the moment is pretty short. <laughs> and then I can get back to you on a better answer. Um, not in this uh, particular context, because I have to actually look at that again. Um, there's a, the Nephilim, it's kind of an interesting thing, and I think it's, it's difficult to, um, to fully ascertain who they are. Um, but there are some who, over the course of time, have claimed that it's referencing angels. I don't believe that that's true. Um, so essentially, giants in the earth, and I think the the best understanding of that is, is that they were giants, not only in terms of size, although that is something that the spies point out, but um, they were giants in the earth also in terms of just uh, giant intellect, giant, I mean, just, they were just noteworthy people almost in every way. Um, and certainly size was part of that, but that's a real short thumbnail, but I can get more to you later. Uh, I I was just wondering because they were talking about them pre-flood and then for some reason I had it in my head that they were all swept away when the flood came, but apparently not because this is well after the flood. 
Right. And I, and that's one thing I have to check on. I, I believe um, they would have been swept away in the flood. Um, the, and that's where I'm a little sketchier without looking back at that a little bit more, but I, um, the children of Israel referencing that it wouldn't be the same people as pre flood, but like unto them, I believe. So I'm, I'll, I'll look at that a little bit more and get back to you with something a little bit more concrete. Thank you. I appreciate that. I knew it was kind of somewhat off topic, but on my mind. It's good. Yep. No, it's good. And I read Nephilim um, and thinking, well, we're not going to go down (laughs) that road. So it's totally good. Totally good. Um, I will look that up and get back to you. Hey, Pastor. Yes. This is Bob with uh, Christy and Armin. Yes. And uh, we just had a comment on the, uh, you know, your printout where you were talking about God and grace and being, you know, objective. Uh, Christy's comment was, what is parenting? That's exactly what I was thinking of. I'm so glad you brought it up, Bob, because I was just thinking the same thing. I, I think that's part of the, the disconnect between who God is and his loving yet just nature is exactly what we see playing out in the confusion in parenting. Um, and I, I just thought, boy, I'd, I always go back to it in my head and it's, not scriptural necessarily, but the old song that says, um, you know, the father is a thundering velvet hand. Um, and so those two natures of God really, as they play out, you know, rightly so as we emulate him as parents, um, that both of those exist, but where you don't see that in life, um, out in society is again, that confusion about who God is and the nature of God. And you see that playing out in parents who are confused about that as well. So that reference to the thundering velvet hand, Dan Fulgerberg, leader of the band, 1973, something like that. Not equal to scripture, but a great, great <laughs> line, a great, great lyric in songs. Um, so, so is that what, what you were mentioning, Bob, in terms of that same um, apparent contradiction of justice and, and love in the parenting thing? What Tina said is what you guys are thinking. Too. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think and I, and as um, you guys are talking too, something that came to mind too, I think part of that overall stumbling block is also in terms of um, it's kind of how we define love, but also the, the human nature that wrongly says, if you love me, you won't ever hurt me. I'm not talking about abuse. I, I don't mean that at all, but I, it hurts to be wrong and it hurts to face the consequence of our actions. Um, and it is a lie of ultimately of Satan that suggests that love never leads to anything that hurts because um you know I'm gonna get the cancer out it's gonna hurt you gotta cut it out but that is that can be an act of love to help heal and ultimately save your life so it's um but it's pretty interesting um and i think that's another example of the the parenting part of that is just another example of how and why it's, it's so fitting that god uses that parental relationship to help us understand our relationship with god and he uses our relationship with God to help inform our relationship, parents to children. It's one of those two-way um, comparisons that God sometimes uses in scripture, and, and which I love because he takes the earthly to help us understand the heavenly, and he uses the heavenly to help us learn how the earthly should be. It's a, a neat character of his word. Another place where he does that is um, husbands and wives in Ephesians, and Christ in the church. Thank you for um, that observation and comment. Any th- that's helpful. Anything else before we move on? Okay, let's. Um, these two additional two references, First Corinthians and Hebrews, we'll take a brief look at. The um, it's in the context in the the idea of how Jude uses these examples, and there are two more yet to come. But the examples of the Old Testament in his application and instruction in his epistle. And that is part of what we should draw as well from really all of scripture. So I wanna go back to um, my other place here. Okay, and we go to First Corinthians. And um, Paul's writing to the Corinthians. He says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers, Israelites, were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. 
we're all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That's incidentally not baptism as we think of it, but the um, kind of a figurative speech of went through this with Moses um, in the cloud and the sea. And they all ate the same spiritual food we, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. This isn't really the main reason why I have this reference in this part of Jude, but this is noteworthy as well. The rock was Christ. As they went through, and we talk about our rock being Christ, it was for them too, just the coming Christ where we have the Christ who has come. This is huge because this is just one of a number of examples where the Old Testament is absolutely Christian. Um, Christ-based. I don't call them Christian then, but it's the same faith, same substance as we have. And there's another similar um, reference down here in verse 9, we must not put Christ to the test. This was Old Testament. They did the same thing. It's, this is all in the context of Christ. We see that in a few other places in the New Testament as well. Um, just making that connection, Old and New Testament. Verse 5, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. This is the key thing of what I wanted to point out. This is the exact same thing. Paul's doing it here for the Corinthians. Jude is doing it in the text that we're looking at. Um, it's These things are there. They're recorded history. There's the truth of God's word interwoven with it in with their story because God is history is God's story. But among all those other things, these are examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. And then Paul goes on to recall, do not be idolaters as some of them were, as is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. That's Exodus 32 in the golden calf. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. And we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, the bronze serpent. And they were complaining. Um, that was the next generation that was complaining there and serpents killed them. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. But um, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. These things were carried out by God in real time, so to speak. These people were living their lives. God was interacting with them just as he does now. They were written down, recorded in scripture for us. You go back to the end of the sermon text this morning. That was the gospel of, of Christ's resurrection specifically. But these are written that you may believe in and believing you may have life in his name. All of scripture is written for us and for our benefit. And here Paul draws on those same Old Testament examples as Jude does. And then verse 13 goes on with the familiar passage, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God will provide the way to escape. I wanted to show you um, here in the, in the handout as well. So these verses, Exodus 32, Numbers 25, Numbers 21, Numbers 14 through 16 are the references to the examples that Paul cites um, here in starting with verse seven. Now this last one, um, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer, 14 through 16 of Numbers includes two things. It includes the section that we just read through with the spies and so forth, but it also records Korah's rebellion. Um, it could really, uh, this could apply to either one of them um, or both of them. But it's interesting because this terminology, the destroyer, is something that God also uses in Exodus 12, verse 23, and that's in reference to the killing of the firstborn in the 10th plague of Egypt. If you had blood on the doorpost, the destroyer would pass over um, your house. So that's the same kind of thing. So it would be God who is here bringing judgment on them. The destroyer is God, or at least his agent, to accomplish that. The other one then, similar oops, similar passage in Hebrews is um, 3, 7 to 19. <clears throat> Different writer, um, the writer of the Hebrews, but much the same idea as well. 
Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Remember, as Paul said, examples that you do not follow in the same evil. So do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. This is a reference to... Um, what we just saw in Numbers. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said they will always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now here's the application. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, and none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And this is the summary. What was it that kept the children of Israel out of the promised land? Unbelief. What was it that, was going, that would reap God's judgment um, on the false teachers that Jude points out and anyone who would follow them? Unbelief and rejection of what God says. Because unbelief throws away the gospel and salvation of Christ, that is the thing that damns. It's not. Um, because that is what is disregarding your way of salvation. All sins were paid for by Christ, but if I throw that gift away, I will be lost eternally. That is why Jude is so urgently warning his readers, because that's what's on the line. Faith and contending for the faith and the truth of God's word versus being pulled into a rejection of that word and unbelief. That's how important it is, and Jude emphasizes it with these examples. Hey, Wayne. Jason, go ahead. The Bible, when the Bible talks about 40 years, do they mean one day as in 10 years, or do they mean 40 years as four or five days? How does that, does that make mean, sense? It means 40 years just like you are not 40, the same kind of years as you are old. So 40 actual years. Any other comments or thoughts? Okay. We have, um, looking here at the handout, we have pretty well gone through um, these three points. We're going to the second example now that Jude references. This is an interesting one for a number of different reasons. <clears throat> the angels who did not stay within their position of authority but left their proper dwelling he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And just a pronoun identification, this he would be, or is, I should say, God. The ESV does not capitalize divine pronouns, but that is reference to God. So the angels left their proper dwelling. God has kept them in eternal chains under gloomy darkness. One of the things that makes this an interesting example on Jude's part as he's writing to his readers is there is no record of this event in the historical books. Uh, we'll look at some passages where it's referenced, but in terms of like just what we just went through, the children of Israel rebelling against God, we could go back into Numbers and we found the historical account and, okay, this is what Jude's referencing. We don't have that in the same way with this illustration of the angels. Uh, and so looking at that a little bit further, uh, kind of expanding this to what can we say about the angels and what does God tell us, he does not specifically record the creation of angels either, but they were created by God within the six days of creation and they were all good. We're going to look up the, we're going to look at the Colossians passage, but first of all, we won't look up Exodus and Genesis. Exodus 20, 11 is um, the passage that says in six days God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. So as created beings, angels had to be in that six-day period. So maybe the question comes up then, well, how do you know they were created beings? Well, it had to be because in the beginning, God, that's all there was. God is the only thing, and that's the wrong word, the, God is the only one who is eternal. He, cre he is the creator. 
the angels are part of his creation. And if everything that was made that was made was made in those six days, the angels had to be in there somewhere too, though God does not record it in the account of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. And then Genesis 1.31 is God's declaration that all that he had created was good. So by process of, I suppose you would say deduction, by putting these together, we can say the angels had to be created within the six days. They were all created good. And then we'll take a look at Colossians 1.6, which really is just the same thing, but a little bit different. Um, Paul writes, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. So this is this is includes um, this is a little bit of an added um, part or feature that Colossians, this passage in Colossians gives, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So the angels are certainly in that grouping. <clears throat> Look a little bit further then, um, who or what are the angels? At the outset, we can say they are not what is most often portrayed as, as what they are. There are all kinds of different caricatures and misportrayals of the angels, and that's not scriptural. It's just a, a notion of how they are. And I, well, I'll come back to that in a second. So, um, angelus is the Greek word for angel. If it were translated, it means messenger. And so at the very base root of the name, angels are messengers. Sometimes the, the message that they carry is words and message in that sense. And sometimes the message is words and action. I think of the angels that God sent to Abraham on the way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, the son of God was involved in that too, but there were also angels there. Um, I'll say run-of-the-mill angels, but non-God, um, the angels were there. So the the message does not always just mean the words. It can also mean activity that the angels accomplish, and we'll look at some of the passages that show um, some of that activity as well. So just um, out of curiosity and kind of for fun, how many different examples of angels serving as messengers can we recall? Maybe have Wayne two maybe. Okay, what are they, Jason? What do you mean? Who? Who? Or what do you mean? Who? Well, what? What? What are the? What's the circumstance? Saint Michael. Saint Michael. Michael. Yeah. What? what Michael, I'm yeah, looking Michael for, the archangel. Right. He's referenced by name. Um, Michael and Gabriel are the only two Peter? angels that are mentioned by name. Peter, right? Nope. Peter is not an angel, but an angel Saint appeared Peter. to him. So an angel, um, an angel was sent by God to deliver Peter out of prison. So that's an example of an angel being sent with a message. Satan's Peter, an angel. Um, uh, an angel being sent with a message. Peter, you're going to be set free, and I'm going to get it. I'm going to get you out. That was the message, and then the angel actually did that as well. Um, Satan was an angel too. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. We're, it's a step ahead of us. But what are some of the other examples where God sent angels as messengers to? people on earth no we get to named named My not the names of the angels but just the um examples of when they shared glenn says the angel to mary of course yeah angel to mary um gabriel to mary gabriel to zachariah um the angels on christmas announcing the birth of jesus so and then the angels in the empty tomb on easter those are key messages from angels that God sent the angels to deliver to people coming birth the birth and the resurrection and the Caleb ascent. says the angel that came to Jesus after he prayed in Gethsemane yeah, another great example too um, when Jesus was agonizing in the garden of Gethsemane an angel was sent to minister to him also after the 40 days in the wilderness and being tempted by the devil early in his ministry angels came and ministered to him the message was one of action again, bringing um, encouragement and sustenance to Jesus to strengthen him. Angel came to Elijah. Yep. So then there are quite a few. It's interesting in the Old Testament, there are some of some examples where the angel of the Lord 
is referencing the pre-incarnate Son of God, which would be different, um, might be somewhat the same purpose, but that would stand separate from a uh, uh, run-of-the-mill angel isn't the right way to describe it, but uh, one of the created beings. So the eternal Son of God comes and is identified at times as the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. That's different than this, because this is a created being, the Son of God, um, not that. But quite a few examples. Um, there are more. Uh, we came up with a number of them here, all in one way or another, doing God's bidding and serving as his messengers. So if we take a look at some of these other passages that are here, starting with Hebrews 1.14, we can learn a little bit more about what God does say about the angels. So Hebrews 1.14, are they not all ministering spirits? ministering or serving spirits. So they are spirit beings. They have of themselves no bodies. They are in that regard like God. They are spirit beings. Now we see them coming at different times in bodily form, like those coming to Abraham. Presumably that would have been how Gabriel appeared to Mary and Zechariah as well. Um, we know that there are different types of angels, the cherubim and the seraphim that are described the seraphim having six wings, the um, cherubim having two. That's part of that way in which they present themselves, but they are at base level ministering spirits and serving. So the question comes up after those first six words of Hebrews 1.14, whom are they serving? And God says they are sent out by God to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Put another way, the angels are spirits, created spirits of God, sent to serve you as children of God. That's their purpose, uh, announcing the gospel, announcing all these different things, protecting, um, doing God's bidding. So they, <coughs> excuse me, they are serving spirits sent by God, authorized by God for God's purposes, for the blessing of and purpose of serving us as God's children. Another thing we can learn is in Psalm 103, where the psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word. This is one of those caricatures of angels that is not accurate, where they are portrayed as maybe babies, maybe as these um, soft and gentle, cuddly little angels. They're mighty ones who do his word. There is no angel you'd want to mess with. Um, this description in Psalm 103 is much more comforting when we get to the idea that God sending his angels to protect us. Um, not a little baby angel sitting on a cloud coming to do something for us, but a mighty angel who excels in strength. Not excelling to the point of being past God, but excelling in strength as he enables them. And we're going to get to Satan here in a little bit, but... Um, Keep in mind, though, this, this is comforting, mighty ones who do God's word, but from those mighty ones who do God's word are Satan and those who fell with him, and so the enemies that we have are also mighty. Not greater than God still, but the might of the good angels that comforts us as, as God uses them for us is also the caution of the might of the evil angels that are working against us. So that does cut both ways in that regard. And then Psalm 91, uh, 11 to 12, familiar passage. He will command his angels concerning you, again, serving believers, to guard you in all your ways. On their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. So very much... Uh, God protecting us, sending his angels to do that. Pretty interesting because God sometimes can, or sometimes will do that directly. And then he also tells us he sends his angels to accomplish that all again, according to his purpose in each circumstance and each time. The, um, there are a couple other passages back on the, oh, I can just jump there real quick. Um, in the handout, second Kings six, eight to 17, Daniel six. These are just two examples of, of where God sent angels for protection and deliverance. Um, there are other examples too, but there are a couple additional passages there that are interesting and instructive in that way, but much of the same along the lines of what Psalm 91 is saying. 
Luke 15, 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Beautiful picture of the angels of God rejoicing over every sinner that repents. Also giving us the insight that they serve God according to his purpose and his will. And because they are holy, they also rejoice in what God rejoices in. So they're going to um, have joy over every sinner that repents because that is God's desire. God, our Savior, desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's desire, God's will. The angels are his servants, are on board with what he wants. So they're going to rejoice also when that happens, when someone comes to repentance. And then one more reference in this regard, um, 1 Peter 1, 3 to 12, but especially verse 12. Um, just to look briefly, so verses 3 through 9 is that beautiful Easter uh, section of 1 Peter, begotten us to an inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. In that context, now in verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So prophesied, now verse 12, it was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So the prophets were given those words and wrote them down for us, much like the passages we looked earlier at earlier with the examples being for us. Now all of this, this um, joy of salvation and inheritance uh, reserved for us in heaven, the prophets proclaiming this to us and writing it down for us, these are all things into which angels long to look. And that, again, being on the same page as God, rejoicing what he rejoices in, serving in his purpose, but also uh, showing that we are above the angels. And we think of the angels as being greater than us. They're protecting us. But that's the point. God does send them. They are strong. But their purpose is to serve us. They excel us in many, many ways. But they're still sent by God for us. Human beings are the crown of God's creation, always have been, always will be. The earthly world is to serve um, mankind. The invisible spirit world, so to speak, of the angels is there to serve us. And we are the ones that the Son of God died for to redeem us. We are above the angels in that sense. Not, that's not to pride, but that's just to reassure us and give us this is the status that God has given us and these angels many strong are sent by God for us that's a far different picture about angels and what we see in the world but what a difference that makes what a joy to have that truth about the angels that God sends for his purposes for us anyway. um, one one last thing Jason um, and then I'll, I'll let you have a chance here. One other passage I missed before I just wanted to mention briefly too is Matthew 18 10. Um, here Jesus in connection with the parable of the lost sheep says see that you do not despise one of these little ones for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. This is the passage that leads to the idea that everybody has, um, or in particular, specifically, every child has their own guardian angel. This passage doesn't say that. This passage does say that they're angels that are sent out for um, the uh, serving these little ones, as Jesus says, see the face of my Father who is in heaven. It is taking it a step too far to say that there is a specific angel assigned to each individual. Maybe. Um, it could be. But that's not what this passage is saying. And I personally prefer to think of one angel doesn't do it. So there are many angels that God sends um, at different times to serve in different ways for us. Okay, Jason. Are you there? I am. So angels are sent by messenger, messengers, but in, um, are, are, so are angels sent for people, so angels are sent to, for instance, when somebody, um, tell me if this is true, when somebody gets in something 
or when something horrible happened in their life, whatever it is, like for instance, somebody got in a hor let's say somebody got in a horrible car accident and they they didn't die. Does that mean that angels were there? It could be. It means that God certainly pre preserved their life. Um, he may have done that by sending angels to accomplish some diversion of something greater or whatever it might be. Uh, we have the examples in scripture of knowing where angels were sent by God to intervene or to do a particular thing because God tells us that. In our life, he doesn't say, here's an angel doing this or here's an angel that has done this. He simply tells us, these are the angels. This is what they do. They do it for you. And we take him at his word, how he, how he does that or man, um, manages that day to day in each individual situation, we don't know and we don't need to. We simply just say, we and rejoice to know God is watching over me. He sends his angels for his purposes for me. And that's pretty great. Um, other comments or thoughts anybody has? Um, I was just going to say that a lot of times the angels would come to the prophets when they had visions and they would interpret them for them. So they would kind of communicate what God was trying to tell them in, in visions that they couldn't understand. They might bridge the gap between the heavenly and the, and the earthly. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. So that's a good example, again, of bearing the message and helping in that. Um, it's interesting too, just as an example, along the lines of what Tammy just mentioned, um, but also in connection with we don't know how God does the ins and outs necessarily. When God announced the, um, the birth of Jesus to Mary, it was Gabriel appeared to her. Birth of John the Baptist to Zechariah, Gabriel appeared to him. When God um, warned Joseph, sent an angel in a dream or in a vision, along the lines of what Tammy was saying. So there's same idea, but a little different mode in which God did that. And then certainly with the, uh, the prophets and so forth, as Tammy mentioned too, um, a, ver a wide variety of situations where God sent angels to do his bidding. But again, always for that purpose of serving believers and the overall goal of God in bringing sinners to salvation. Any other comments or thoughts? Okay. Let's um, close with the blessing and then anybody that wants to stay and chat for a while, I certainly may. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. And blessings Amen. on the week ahead. Amen. Hey, have a good day, Wayne. Our you too, Jason.